City Dow. Um, so what Rob is handing out right now, I'm sorry, you guys won't have this at VGH. This is just um, a worksheet because I wanted to make this practical. My name's Heather O'Donnell. I'm one of the general ophthalmologists here at Providence. I spend um, three days a week in my clinic just across the street on the corner of Burrard and Davey. I spend Fridays usually, if I'm not away, in the eye clinic on the second floor of the Providence building. And I think I've probably talked to most of you. Um, the enthusiasm that you hear right now is not nerves. This is for those of you who haven't called me before. This is the way I always sound, even at 3 o'clock in the morning. So, um, one of the main reasons I was really excited when Rob said, hey, do you want to come and talk to St. Paul's Ground Rounds? I was like, yes, of course, because I'm desperate to continue to spread the message. I really like hearing from you. I'm happy to collaborate about ophthalmology patients. And I'm, uh, I think, acquiring a larger number of ophthalmologists on my bus that feel the same way. So, you know, we've hired a lot of new people, and um, I think that we have a cohort of people who are really excited about, um, about being part of a Providence team, actually, uh, that provides really exceptional patient care. So uh, my goal is to blast through slides, um, not being a fork. Where is my, how do I make this come up? You guys know what a fork is? The spoon fork? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm going to show you my, my favorite, one of my favorite websites is despair.com. Also, if you haven't visited lately, critical. Um, you really should. Um, for the residents, despair.com. You might want to Google while I'm giving the uh, presentation. Okay, so Frank is still showing up here. Let's see. Try this again. Did that work? PowerPoint. Okay, so you weren't seeing anything I was showing you. Okay, so I have no financial disclosures. Um, the objectives of the talk, we're gonna increase in comfort of, uh, of patients with blunt trauma. I wanna optimize your physical exam in trauma patients um, and create a platform for discussion. And this is what I was meaning about the fork, the art of doing twice as much as you should, half as well as you could. <laughs> when Rob and I talked about what I could talk about in 20 minutes, I had like six things that I wanted to go through. and. While I started making the talk, I pared it down to talking about essentially one thing. So we're going to talk about patients with blunt trauma presenting with hyphema. And my plan is I'm going to give you the same story three times with different physical exam findings, and I want you guys to sort of roll with the presentation filling out the form, so be active um, and ask questions, and I'm not going to necessarily give the answers. I want to facilitate a discussion about these trauma patients and what we do with them. Um, in a Game of Thrones reference, Whistler is coming. Um, so I'm so happy this is the third year that we're going up to Whistler to give myself, Chris Pollock, Karen Mooseberger, and Pete Zakshevsky is an ophthalmologist from Langley that's joining us this year to give this ophthalmology, what is it, it's like a workshop, right? Um, so you do physical, has, has anybody in here, a few of you have attended before, yeah, for sure. Aaron's been there, Kira's been there, I think, yeah. So, um, Please come. If you haven't signed up for it, come and review. We bring three slit lamps, and you get to do at least part of a canthotomy and cantholysis on a pig. So Whistler is coming. That's my plug. Any questions before we start with this scenario? Does this seem like a reasonable plan to everyone? Okay. 43-year-old presents at 8 p.m. Um, following a soccer match. He was hit in the left eye with the soccer ball. The triage notes from the, um, from the desk say that the vitals are stable, that they look well, there was no loss of consciousness, vision's bad, presumably in the left eye. So you're going in to take your history and this is what they tell you. It's a blunt trauma, they had immediate pain after the soccer ball hits the eye, let's call it off of a foot. So foot, soccer ball, soccer ball, orbit. Initial decrease in vision, but generally they say it's actually quite a bit better because it's been like, I don't know, maybe now they're seeing you at 3 a.m. So they're like, yeah, actually, I think the vision's okay. But importantly, they tell you, my vision is not at baseline. Otherwise, they're well, no medications, no allergies, past up to the family history, and this is what you find on their acuity. Huh. So powerful. 
Point now does a thing where they design your slides for you. So this isn't actually perfect because it should be lined up better. But their vision in the right eye is 2025. Vision in the left eye is 2050. And when you give them the pinhole, 2020 and 2050. Is anybody worried? A little bit? Uh, OK. Um, I just want to take a moment to talk about acuity in the emergency department. So Snellen, iChart, whether you're using the chart in the hallway or whether you're using your app, the most important thing about this eye chart is that um, it has to be properly calibrated. So if you're working here, you're working anywhere else, make sure that at least somebody at some point in time, we're renovating things constantly and things get hung on different places. So if we're going to use nomenclature that's consistent, we need to make sure that the charts are properly calibrated. What do these numbers mean? Often we tell people 2020 is the distance at which a normal eye can see, at, uh, or is the distance at which a normal eye can see that letter, something like this. Truth is, Snellen, who developed it, used math, the numerator, the first 20 is the distance at which the test is taken. And the second number is the distance at which the height of that letter subtends five minutes of arc. Bleh. It's math and it's standardized. So we need to make sure we use a standardized distance. The, the, so your chart will say and your app will say, use this at a meter or use this at nine feet. Um, 2020 is good vision. 2200 is crappy vision. But we don't stop there when we're thinking about um, quantifying acuity. So after they can't see the 2200 or 2400 line, you are going to check for how many fingers they can count. And tell us or tell your colleagues, you know, they were able to count fingers at one foot, but they couldn't count fingers at six feet. And that matters six hours from then when I'm seeing the patient. It's helpful to know that it actually improved. Hand motion, so I'm waving my hand and I say, you know, is my hand moving side to side or up and down? Um, and this is like super crappy vision, we'll call it. And then don't stop there, please. If they can't see your hand moving, you need to know if they can see light. No light perception vision is an exceptionally poor prognostic sign and this patient, um, so we need to know that and it's important to get to that level as opposed to just saying they couldn't see the eye chart, okay? Um, and I have no problems with the 3 a.m. can't see call. Um, so the ophthalmic exam, we go back in, we finish the other things. Pressure is 18 in the right, 22 in the left. Pupils constrict, but maybe it's a little bit sluggish on the left. Extracular movements are full. Why does this matter in blunt trauma with the soccer ball? What's a common associated injury with them? What do they get? Why do we care about their extracular movements? Yeah, Sorry? Blow-off fracture. Blow fracture, thank you. Exactly. Um, so do this in every one of these patients. Um, and then your confrontational fields are normal. So on slit lamp, lamp exam, you see a little bit of injected conjunctiva, but everything else looks pretty normal. And this is what the eyeball looks like. So does anybody want to comment? So you can see the injected conjunctiva here. Um, if I like, let's see. I mean, yeah, it works. So injected conjunctiva. Does anything else look bizarre here? You can't really see the cornea just based on the broad beam. So there's no appropriate, really, corneal light reflex. But you can see the iris, and you can see the lens. What do you see? So first of all, so I'm going to point something out here. The pupil looks round, but it's not perfectly round. And if you can find these little nicks on the iris, every time you've got blood in the anterior chamber. So on your slit lap exam, you didn't feel like you saw anything. There certainly wasn't a frank hyphema, but the vision's a little bit low. OK. so. We're not going to talk about the diagnosis or plan. I just want you to fill, take a moment, fill this out. So these are the questions. So for the residents in the other room, you can just like write out the numbers one to five on each of the scenarios, right? Is this an ocular emergency? Is this patient going to recover from it? Are they at risk of blindness? Do they need, do you need to call ophthalmology? And if you need to call them, when should the patient be seen? So now you know kind of the baseline scenario. I'm going to change up a few things, and we're going to make a decision about whether or not we think, Rob, you're not writing anything down. If you don't think I'm going to call you out, I know your name. So <laughs> it's like, do the work, Rob. <laughs> I'm going to ask you. OK. Um, I want, like, engage, OK? Help me out here. 
It's not that exciting of a presentation, so if you don't engage, it's like going to be over in 10 minutes. Okay. Actually, it probably has to be over in 10 minutes. All right. 43-year-old, same story. No loss of consciousness, poor vision. Soccer ball hit the left eye, decreased vision, pains improved. But unlike our first patient where they're like, yeah, I'm pretty well better, maybe not back to baseline, um, the vision's still crappy. Ophthalmic exam, we're 2020 and 2080, and it doesn't change with pinhole. Pressure is the same, 18 and 22. Extraocular movements are full and the fields are normal. And on the anterior segment exam, what do you see? This is the blood in the AC. This is okay, fine. Um, so now take a moment and think about this patient. Are they any different than the other guy? And what would you do? So first of all, is this an ocular emergency? Will this patient recover from their injury, and are they at risk of blindness? Does anybody know what the legal requirement, like what's the classification of blindness in Canada? 2200, or like a marked constriction of your visual field. Um, so, you know, are they at risk of central blindness? Are they at risk of field-related blindness? Is assessment warranted, and when should, when should they be seen? Give me more time. For all you people furiously writing, I see you not writing. Okay, same story. Soccer ball hits left eye, immediately, immediate pain, loss of vision, a little bit of tearing, vision hasn't changed. Except now this patient comes in, they're feeling unwell, feeling just nauseated. Um, on ophthalmic exam, vision is 20-25 in the right, hand motions vision in the left. Intraocular pressure is 18, and the pressure on the other side is not readable. Just can't get it. Anybody had the experience in the last six months that you couldn't read an intraocular pressure? Like all the time, and there's like 15 different reasons for that. Like somebody dropped the tonneau pen, it's not calibrating properly, the patient's not compliant, their eyelids are impossible to open, you know, there aren't any of the little stupid cover things around. There's a million reasons that it's not readable. We're going to talk about two important ones. Um, extra oxygen movements are full, fields are normal. Fields are normal on the right. Of course, you're not able to obtain proper fields on the left because the patient can't see. Um, the conjunctive is a little bit injected, but the cornea looks normal. But there's no view into the AC. You just can't see anything. And this is what you see. So the question then becomes, again, what's next? Is this an ocular emergency? Because truthfully, the diagnosis in so many cases doesn't really matter, right? Like what you want to decide when you're staring at this patient is, you know, are they going to get better from this? Because even some really crappy looking things like those total epithelial defects where the patient is in excruciating pain and convinced that they are not going to survive and will be blind forever, are going to be better with no sequelae in 24 hours. Like, you don't even have to look at them. They're not a big deal. Um, the, but other patients, that's not the case. So is this patient at risk of blindness, and should ophthalmology get involved? Okay. Are we okay so far? So scenario one, here's audience, audience participation time. Diamond Center, we're asking you. Here is our patient. What's the diagnosis? Not that I think it's super relevant, but tell me what you call what do you call this? Diamond Center? I think it's your rundown to the mic. Oh. That's kind of mean. Okay, somebody here shouted out. No? It's traumatic medriasis, I'll give you that. Yes, that's correct. So we have a traumatic uh, dilation of the pupil. And the reason it, it's traumatic medriasis is because this is an iris sphincter tear. And this patient has a microhyphema. Even though you didn't perceive the blood in the anterior chamber, almost certainly it's there. And when they see ophthalmology, hopefully in, in the next 24 hours, you're going to find out that indeed there was blood in the anterior chamber. Sometimes it even settles out and you see the hyphema eight hours later. So is this an ocular emergency? No. This patient um, does not need to be seen immediately. The pressure of 22 doesn't really have you concerned. But, um, but 
the patient does need to be seen by ophthalmology, and uh, while they will recover from their injury, they are indeed at risk of blindness. Does anybody know why these patients go blind? I mean, there's a couple reasons they could, but... So any time that there is a blunt injury that's severe enough to cause bleeding inside the eye, the angle, which I'll show you in a moment, gets damaged. And our eyeball looks like an eyeball not, and not a raisin because of fluid pressure in it. Our eyeball makes liters of fluid every day. And there's a certain amount of redundancy built into the drainage system. And when you smush it with a soccer ball or any other blunt object, sufficient enough to cause bleeding in the anterior segment, you've caused damage to that trabecular meshwork. These patients recover very quickly from a visual acuity perspective. They don't have significant symptoms afterwards. But 10 years later, they have a 40% risk of elevated intraocular pressure. And elevated intraocular pressure can blind people without them knowing. So the reason you're calling about this patient isn't because that patient's got another significant ophthalmic injury. You know, they're not complaining of photopsia that make you think about a retinal tear. They're not, you don't pick up a confrontational field defect. They don't have an emergency now. But we need to see these people so that we can look, in the, look them in the eye and say, you are an ophthalmology patient for life. We need to follow you. Okay, so yes, ophthalmology should see and they should see within the next 24 hours. Let's talk a little bit about the anatomy. <laughs> my, my drawing of the hyphema um, on paint. Okay, so this is also a terrible picture of an eyeball. This is UBC actually commissioned this picture of the of an eyeball, and I have a real problem with it. It's the one we're all supposed to use now, but can I point out just a few ridiculous things about it just while you're thinking about anatomy? Do you see how, let me see here. Do you see how here is that pal the palpebral fissure is set up so that this is implied to be like a sagittal slice of the eyeball, right? Yeah? Well, does the optic nerve come out like below the center vision? Of course not. It comes out, the reason that pictures are always drawn like this is because the optic nerve comes out 15 degrees medial to the fovea. So they've given you a coronal eyeball and a sagittal lid. Ridiculous. Additionally, <laughs> and that matters. I'm going to convince you this matters. This really matters because at least 80% of the people in this audience and probably 100% of the people at the Diamond Center think they can't do fundoscopy. And if we think about the anatomy and you know that you need to line your patient up 15 to 15 degrees, you can hit the optic nerve every time. But if you're like, mm, I've been getting pictures like this your whole life, you're like, I don't know where the optic nerve is. Of course you don't. We can't even draw it for you. So that's the first thing that's ridiculous about this. 50 degrees, line yourself up. Get yourself well positioned, you're gonna see it every time. Come to the Whistler talk, I'll show you. Okay, the second thing that's ridiculous about this is that it actually, like the visual axis doesn't line up, so it's like this patient is blind, like this patient has some weird congenital anomaly, fine. Okay, but our patient has blood of some sort in the anterior chamber. This is a common problem, two in 10,000 per year, it happens more commonly in men, and sports injuries in some studies account for up to 60% of these injuries, um, work-related injuries, and interesting spontaneous microhyphemas and other diseases that cause them or spontaneous hyphemas we're not gonna get into. Suffice it to say, think about them. Um, spontaneous hyphema should nev never happens in a child without a serious reason. So you need to think about non-accidental injury. Um, and if it's not NAI, it's something nasty like retinoblastoma. So um, hyphema in kids, think about that. The early complications, high intraocular pressure, corneal blood staining, what happens in high IOP is the, the blood that's sitting next to the cornea gets pushed into the corneal stroma, the thickness of the cornea, and you get really decreased vision, um, often necessitating corneal transplant, and re-bleeds up to 40%. So when people have blood in the anterior chamber, we need to see them to treat and have the pupil not moving because when they bleed 40% of the time, a second time, their risks of glaucoma and corneal blood staining go way up. So they're not coming to see you usually when the second bleed has happened, um, but when it does, it's much more serious. Um, they can, of course, get associated injuries. We're just talking about hyphema now, but they get traumatic cataract, and they get retinal tears, retinal dialysis, irritodialysis, cyclodialysis. And these are, 
essentially like different ways that you can yank the iris out of the eye, um, all of those things cause problems for pressure. And then late complications, the corneal blood staining I mentioned, and then this really important concept, and that's really the main thing I want to hit home, is that these are ophthalmology patients for life because they get high IOP and they don't know it. So we've gone through these things. And does anything change then about the frank hyphema? So this patient, I feel like everybody's kind of like, Ugh, that's a more serious problem. It's actually exactly the same. So yes, they need to see ophthalmology. They, ophthalmology should assess them within 24 hours. Um, if this is an 8 p.m. call, it should be seen the next morning. If it's a 5 p.m. call, it should be seen that night. Um, and the, so there we go. Any questions about that? Do you feel like, yeah, that seems reasonable? Okay, good. So what do, yeah, yes. Yeah, iris sphincter tears. In fact, the main thing to look for is that decreased acuity. So trust your exam, right? It doesn't make sense that if you think the anterior chamber is clear, because it's not the iris sphincter tear that gave you the decreased acuity. Now, this is actually kind of a crappy picture, because if, if you look really, really carefully, this, this is a more severe microhyphema than than what I would have expected in the, um, in the patient I presented to you. There's sort of a traumatic cataract here, an early lens opacity. So that could also account for your decreased vision. But either way, you need to explain each one of your exam findings. And this patient has elevated IOP, legitimately elevated IOP. And if you're not sure if you're right about a pressure difference between 18 and 22, I want to hear from you. And I mean, like, I really want to hear from you because I, and we'll talk about this at the very end. I'll, maybe I'll, I'll tell you about what I want you to do about that after. But be confident in your exam findings. That's the key. There was high pressure. The vision's not normal. Erin. How often can you, so sometimes I will repeat my pressure if I get an elevated pressure and it's higher than 18. And I'll say, okay, you know, I'm going to take it, but I retake it. Yes. All the time, all the time. And this is my, so this is one of the reasons I think it's so important that um, we have to gain the skills necessary to get really reliable pressures. Because um, I, I have like a tech in my office who um, for her first like month of work was reading right eye pressures higher and then I'd recheck them and I'd be like, what is the story? And it turns out she's a lefty, she was standing funny and holding the lid awkwardly in patients and getting these elevated. So there's simple things that you do that are for sure and that the patient does that give you aberrant pressures. So A, don't worry about the elevated one when you get the one where you're like, oh yeah, this is normal. If you have a normal reading on the tonneau pen, it's very reassuring. Readings that are, the tonneau pen isn't accurate um, once you get outside the normal range. So its accuracy dramatically drops off. Um, so if you get a 40 on the tonneau pen, I might get 60 or 70. Like it's, and my tonometer taps out at 70. Go ahead. Puff tonometry less reliable. Okay, so most, most have, have, have puff, but you also have tonneau pens. Tonneau? So what should I use? Yeah, use a tonneau pen. Well, okay. The reason you use puff tonometry it depends. the The reason that people are using and that it's popular is it's easier. Okay. Some people will tell me it's easier. All right. The optometrists certainly think it's easier. The tonneau pen is more accurate. So. Um, What's that? <laughs> if you're using a Shiat tonometer, you need to come and talk to me. Like it's that. First of all, like you're a magician, right? Like have you used a Shiat? You laid a patient down and like come, getting out the weights. Oops, I dropped it on your eye. Like no, 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 no. This is and I don't. I can't help you with that either because if you're like, hey, I don't know if my Shiat is calibrated. I'm like, you're gonna have to solve that problem on your own. Um, Okay, but like I can walk you through the calibration of the shadow pens, no problem. Okay, I want to get through, okay, so we're, we're talking about, we talked about what we're going to do. Um, so once they arrive with me, I'm going to do a full ophthalmic exam. If the pressure is high, I'm going to wash out the AC in a setting of very high and uncontrolled IOP. There's one 
uh, scenario we haven't talked about, we'll talk about it in a second. They're going to get cycloplegia because we don't want a pupil that's got a big clot on it moving. Um, so we freeze the pupil for days, usually six. They get anti-inflammatories with prednisolone four times a day for six days. They get ocular hypertensives if they're antihypertensive if it's indicated. Um, has any, I don't want to pick on like gray haired folks specifically, but has anybody been practicing long enough to remember that patients would be admitted with sandbags on their head in two batches? Some, this one person nodding. Okay, so this is what we used to do was admit patients to hospital with hyphema. They'd have sandbags and two patches because we recognize that patients who moved more rebled more frequently and the complications are worse. Now we just educate them, tell them you must rest, don't bend over, um, go home, watch Netflix, and sleep in a lazy boy um, to allow the blood to settle and to reduce the risk of rebleed. They wear shields at nighttime to protect it. And at six weeks after their injury, when all the blood's gone, we're looking directly at that angle to quantify how much damage there is and assess what their risk is for high IOP later. Pausing for photos of, yeah, you got it? Good? Okay, we're good. Awesome. Okay, so here's scenario three. Is this, does this patient have an ocular emergency? Yeah, they do. What is this? We call it an eight ball hyphema. Serious business. Um, so this patient's entire anterior chamber is full of blood. Will this patient require, recover from their injury? It depends how properly we manage it. Um, some of them will. They're certainly at risk for blindness and we need to see them immediately. Um, but this one had a funny history, right? It had the IOP not detectable. So what's the story? Is this IOP too low or is it too high? I don't want there to ever be the circumstance where you're saying, I just don't trust my IOP. Um, again, I'm here for that. Um, very high IOP warrants initiation of ocular hypertensives. Always start with Timolol in hyphema patients. Always think about sickle. So, um, sickle cell and sickle trait uh, have much higher risk of very elevated IOP. So if somebody walks into your department and, you, and, it, and sickle occurs to you at all, the problem is if you load a patient with sickle up with a whole bunch of drops that are going to decrease the pH in their AC, um, you'll get more sickling of the cells in the anterior chamber. Their pressure will go even higher. They get intractable glaucoma. And even with AC washouts, they go blind. Um, and I, I mean, like, they, like, this is so common, but, like, I haven't been, clearly I haven't been in practice that long, um, and I've seen it once. Um, so that's a lot, right? One blind patient from this problem is um, enough for my career, okay? Um, so think about sickle. What if the reason that the IOP wasn't readable is that it was too low? Has anybody had this phenomenon? So when you are checking pressure, you can tell. Because an eyeball where the IOP is low, tacos, right? You're like, eh, the pressure is going in and so is the tono, or the cornea is going in and so is the tonneau pen. So you need to pay attention to that while you're doing the pressure. You're not just like blindly grabbing the lids and like eh, trying to get it in there. You gotta watch it. So you have to position yourself in such a way next to the eyeball where you can see that it's um, that the eyes actually that it's too soft. If it's too soft, there's two reasons. One of them is displayed here, which is when you look at a subconjunctival hemorrhage in an eye that has low pressure, do you see this part of the, of the hemorrhage that's just like a little bit darker? That's ruptured sclera. So this is an open globe. Even though you don't have the pupil drying over, this AC isn't full of blood, this is an occult rupture. Um, 360 degrees of subconjunctival hemorrhage should make you nervous about this. Um, if that pressure is low, this patient's going to surgery um, that night, right away. Um, even, if, even if I was just a little bit suspicious, I'm taking the patient to do a pyridomy and to check and see if there's any um, occult rupture. And then watch for other signs of occult rupture, um, uh, uh, signs of detachment. So if the patient's experiencing funny photopsia, in the setting of an eight ball hyphema, that's the retina telling you something, right? Because that's the only message that the retina can send to the brain is lights on, lights off, right? It can't say like, I'm coming off here or something hurts. Their pain is no help. But photopsia, that gives you a clue. So how is this working? Eyeballs full of blood. There's a tear in the retina. Why is the pressure low? 
you know, I pressure close, so this is what happens. So fluid goes underneath the retina, and the pumps in the retina start to work over time to repair the detachment. And because the RPE pumps are incredibly powerful, um, they actually lower the pressure inside the eye. This is another clue in patients who come in with flashes and floaters. If you get a flashes and floaters patient that has wildly asymmetric intraocular pressure, especially low IOP in the affected eye, be concerned that you're missing a tear. And then of course, this is my very fancy anim animation for a ruptured globe. That's the other reason it could be low. Okay. So how did you do on your one, two, three, four, fives? Were there things that you thought, like definitely everybody thinks the eight ball hyphen is an emergency. Um, I want to emphasize on trusting and explaining your exam findings. Subnormal vision has to have an identifiable cause, um, or you should call us. Um, hyphema and microhyphema absolutely recover, but they're ophthalmology patients for life, and you can blind them if the drainage system is damaged and you send them home, right? Um, think about sickle cell in every patient with a hyphema, and beware of occult ruptures. Those are the messages. And then the final thing that I want to tell you about is something that I'm working on, and it's a bookings dot com site. So every Friday, I'm in the St. Paul's Eye Clinic, often all by myself, doing nothing. So do we have any other residents here? Emerge Okay, there you are. Oh, you're the new crop, though. I haven't met you yet. So um, I met some of you, but um, but the so I've started a new program with Rob. Now it's two years ago, right? Um, where the eMERGE residents, I do academic half day, and then they each rotate through two clinics on a Friday with me. Um, but they're not always there, not because they don't show up, they're very reliable, but because there are more Fridays than there are eMERGE residents. So I have time, and I block that time specifically for teaching. So I recently opened it up to the urgent primary care family doc, so I have somebody coming with me next week who's going to come and just spend the afternoon. I book very few patients in that clinic because the intent is to be available for the emergency department. So I'm only there, like I can see 50 patients in my, in my office, I can see four patients in St. Paul's because a very different efficiency sort of model in that eye clinic. So I choose to book very few patients when I'm there just so that I can teach. So what I like to say is if when I talk about the decreased vision or the decreased pressure and you're like, it would be nice to have somebody watch me take pressure and make sure that I'm doing this right, just call me. And I put my number on the first slide. So I'm going to put go back to that. And um, oh, we talked about, there we go. So. Questions, comments? How high is the risk of acute angle closure from setting up acute micro microwaves? Angle closure would be exceedingly unlikely. That's not the mechanism of the high pressure. So um, the in order for the the hemorrhage would have to be behind the iris and three hundred and sixty degrees in or Remember, the mechanism of angle closure is pupil block. It's that um, where as the pupil con con either constricts or dilates over a large lens that the, fl the aqueous flow dynamics change and the pressure builds up behind the iris, right? Pressure goes up behind the iris and then that bowing pushes the angle closed. So in order for that to happen in this traumatic situation, um, you'd have to have a whole lot of blood where it shouldn't be. It doesn't quite, doesn't quite fit. Um, so the you know, need for iridotomy or something in this setting, unlikely. The mechanism is the blood is plugging the anterior chamber. Yeah? No, because if that patient, if it was a black patient with sickle cell that walked in with that pressure of 22, their pressure, their pressure is going to be 40 in an hour. So, so the sickler, the patients that sickle will present with like a little bit of an elevation, but then their pressure is going to be through the roof. So, if you're, so think about it and call earlier, or just remind the resident who, sh like this is really, I mention it, but truthfully, um, I, I think ophthalmology expects calls about every one of these patients, and the ophthalmologist should ask if there are any chances the patient has uh, sickle cell, and you'll go, hmm, they don't know, I don't know, maybe they're at risk, let's look. Does that answer the question? Okay. I don't know who's next. Frank, go ahead. Um, you look super annoyed, by the way. <laughs> you know, just, you're like, I'm like, oh, this is going to be bad. You look like really angry. I don't know. But okay, tell me, what's your question? 
this is pretty cool. It's like a cooperative alert stable patient. A lot of our patients that we've had to lock trauma out, like you know, nursing home and get debilitated to use communication and lose control of examining. So one of the things I do, I use um, ultrasound examination. I also realize that many patients with high femas have associated injuries, you know, limb injuries, yes. and that other stuff. Any tips for um, Yeah, so, yeah, the really, the only, so, so in this setting, in the eight ball setting, I think it has a role. I think, mm, bias, okay? Um, like, the resolution of your ultrasound is not as good as the resolution of light and me looking in, okay? It's just not. You're, um, but in the eight ball where I can't see in, I'm getting an ultrasound on that patient the next day anyways. And if you're savvy enough that you can say, and I don't see a detachment, or the posterior pole is full of blood is incredibly helpful. So I think that's where it has some utility. Never should the ultrasound replace the two pieces of information that are most useful to us, which is vision and pressure, right? When you say you have an uncooperative patient, I don't care if you can put an ultrasound on the eye. What I need to know is how are we going to get this patient to a place where we can accurately know those two things? Um, so, uh, you know, this is where collaboration I think is so important because I think that it's those situations where, like, I've had to twice actually put a lid speculum in a patient to make sure I was getting an accurate pressure um, because the lids were just so swollen. And in the setting of, like, the nursing home patients, right, like, they've got this massive periocular hematoma and you can't open the eye well. Well, that's where I need to show up and help and we need to get the pressure together or I need to get the pressure, right? Um, and having the ultrasound in the eye doesn't help me at all with that. So, so yes, super helpful in the eight ball, but I would just emphasize like vision, pressure, most helpful things we can get. Yeah. Hi. Um, I don't know how many of these micro I've seen this over the years. But going down the Yeah. The first patient that had the trauma yeah. is only a little bit elevated. He's getting gender. I don't know anything. Yeah. But is, this, is that story enough to talk to you guys? Um, this is what I thought you would be doing. You know, so I think the story, if you have truly no explanation, so a lot of these patients for that in that 20, 40, 20, 50 vision range following blunt trauma have corneal findings that explain it as well. So when you're saying like, Ugh, how many of these have I missed? They're not that common. You know, usually you can see the blood layering out. And also, it depends. You may not have missed any because maybe your anterior chamber exam is really good. So may, like you see the blood. If you can see cells in uveitis, you can see blood in hyphema patients and you're looking for it, right? So don't feel like you didn't, you missed a whole bunch of them. Maybe you didn't, maybe you're really good at it. If you're sitting here thinking, I know I'm not really good at it, call me. Um, because I think that this is not like, <laughs> I can assure you there's nothing magical that's happening in the ophthalmology department other than a bunch of practice, right? So please like just come. Um, like key message, ophthalmologist, not special. Um, the, the, um, yeah, so um, yes, I want to hear about them. If you feel really comfortable that there's really nothing going on, you don't see big iris sphincter tears, their pupils are pretty normal, and the, it's just the vision down, then that's the patient that you should fax the referral in. So um, we have that new triage. I don't know if it's like, if it's actually up in the department, but um, I just did this for Emerge Providence. Is this it? Um, no, handout. PHC on call emerge referral flow. Okay, can you see that? Oh, mm. I don't know how to make this go away. Rats. So there's a beautiful flow chart um, that talks about urgent versus like obviously the emergent things we want to hear about, but we're trying to move to get all of these like should be seen this week to the on-call ophthalmologist's office. So there's like a bazillion cards of mine in the emergency department in Fast Track, so that's pretty easy. Um, and I'm on call next week, so they'll all come to me. But we're trying to also get the staff ophthalmologist's offices on board because the coverage 
I'm sure you can agree, it isn't always available in the St. Paul's Eye Clinic, right? And the clerks there, like we've missed a lot of emergent patients because they're just not being seen within that one week. When you want them seen within a week, we're like, oh, well, the next time some O'Donnell is there on a Friday is two weeks from now, and that's when your patient will be seen. So we're trying to get you to fax the consult to the or the referral, so your discharge summary goes to the on-call ophthalmologist, and they have an obligation to see that patient within a couple of days. I mean, frankly, they have an obligation to see the patient the next morning. They're on call. That's what they're being paid for. So, so if you're worried, just fax the referral, urgent, and that office should contact the patient. And you should have cards from every ophthalmologist's office. So far, I think it's just three of us that have them there, but that's what we're working towards is it should be easy to get them in. Yeah. You would absolutely not. You wouldn't. The, the scleral rupture, so in order to have a positive site L sign, you actually need pouring aqueous. And in the case where the sclera ruptures, what's poking through is the choroid. And then um, the eyeball, we think, of, like we talk about it as like you have conjunctiva and then you have sclera. But there's this thing called tenon's capsule, which kind of holds the muscles in place and it envelops a lot of the globe. Um, and it's quite robust and it will hold back a lot of the uvea from pouring forward. So um, once I cut that in, this, in surgery, all of a sudden I think like, Bleh, and that might leak some fluid, but you're not going to see side outside. And then how would you differentiate that sclera rupture from like a chemosis? Because the ones are kind of raised and red. And right. So can I rephrase your question? So how do you differentiate a cult rupture from a really bad, crappy-looking 360-degree subconjunctival hemorrhage? Right, because chemosis really is like just the swelling; it's not the hemorrhage. Um, so, and the answer is you can't. And if you don't know, the ophthalmologist takes that patient to the OR and explores. So, your history matters, and the physical exam matters because the guy who's on aspirin and sneezed while he was going to the bathroom or something like eh, a chew and bleh, <laughs> right? Like nobody thinks that dude's got a globe rupture. I, I hope, right? <laughs> Yeah, okay, so, right, but same nursing home patient that can't give you a history that maybe fell and hit their eye and you can't get an acuity on them, that patient is going to the OR. Was that good, Aaron? You like the eh, sneeze? <laughs> okay, good, all right, so does that make sense? So for sure we'd explore it. Other questions? I'm over my time, I'm sorry. Good. Thank you. Okay. And like, any time. Call me. Call me. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, Rob. I needed here. Okay. Hey guys. So I see that the coffee's arrived. So if anyone wants to take a couple minutes to grab a, a quick coffee, then we'll continue on here. But thanks for for Heather again. She's such a an educational champion. No, I'll promote you more. You know, come on, have a I think, wow, she's standing by the Like at the end of the presentation, some ophthalmologists, you know, yeah, it's kind of steeper than this, and it's maybe it's deeper than this, but, you know, you're, you're showing, like, Cerner, like, the application. And it was made a little bigger, but maybe not big. So the ophthalmologist said, you know, you should really stand at the back and see your presentation. You can't read anything. I think you're, you're not the mildest, right? You know that if you move close to the thing, they appear bigger. Why don't you move down to the front row if you're having trouble seeing it? Oh, my God. Why did you take it? Not well.
All right, so, so guys, I think we're going to keep the, the show rolling here, just in the interest of time and the fact that we have a, um, a meeting right afterwards. So if anyone who's not actively getting a coffee, do you mind uh, getting back to the seats and we'll keep going? <laughs> oh, I know. Dude, <laughs> Cal is laserized at me, man. How about Alright, thank, thanks, Heather. <laughs> So again, guys, for those of you who haven't met yet, my name's Rob Sauna. I'm the uh, EM program. <laughs> that's from, that's from, come on, man. You're killing me here. <laughs> Sorry, guys, we're going to get the, pro the show going here. All right, so just as an outline, we are going to modify it a bit just because uh, in the interest of time, um, and I know we have the meeting right afterwards. I'm going to cut out my end talk here so that Dan Abrams, our resident um, who's presented today, will have a chance to do his presentation. I do want to take a quick minute, though, and introduce our current EM residents. So similar to last year, where um, at our, one of our first grand rounds we got to introduce our residents, we asked them to present a few slides or, or send me a few slides so that I could read them out to you guys and give you guys an idea of who they are and uh, what their background is. So these are the slides that they sent to me. Um, and I got to apologize, my computer crashed on me, so I'm using this backup one that modified the format a bit, so if it doesn't look as beautiful as it was to the resident when you sent them out, my fault, okay? But the first uh, resident I want to introduce you to is Quentin Jenis, and uh, Quentin's our EM chief resident this year. And you know, when I, I first met Quentin, I, I glanced at his name and I thought it said Quentin Genius, right? But I, uh, after uh, reviewing my first case together on shift, you know, I never made that mistake again. So, <laughs> Quentin, uh, Quentin wants to let you know that he was Alberta born, raised, he did med school at the U of A. He did a master's in Scotland in uh, medical ethics, which is kind of cool. Uh, family practice in Victoria and then now here at St. Paul's. Some fun facts he wants you to know about him. He said he's a mean facial hair enthusiast. He's a dad life enthusiast. So he's got a two year old and a recent two month old Rowan. And congrats to Quentin's wife who pushed out Rowan who's 10 and a half pounds. So uh, quite the feat there. Um, he's an office enthusiast and he's a mountaineering enthusiast as well. <laughs> so and he likes Birkenstocks. I bet. Uh, for academic interest, Quentin says he likes medical ethics and philosophy, specifically theories of individual autonomy, use of principle versus casuistry-based ethics in the ED settings. So I think he's trying to regain his genius status by using that casuistry <laughs> expression. To me. It's not working, Quentin. It's not working. Yet, man. <laughs> but he likes medical education, sim as well. And for those of you like myself who need a, a refresher on casuistry, it refers to the resolving of specific cases of conscious duty or conduct through interpretation of ethical principles or religious doctrine. I didn't put that. No, I added that. Yeah. Just for myself, I had a... <laughs> but that's Quentin. Again, our chief resident, Mr. Kazza's tree. He's a great guy. I think he'll be representing the group. Um, the next is Ben Fridge. So Ben is this year's Enhanced Skills Chief Resident. And uh, he's also been in, in independent practice for a couple years now, working to merge and um, inpatient basis, as well as doing some hospital admin work in his hospital. Um, <clears throat> But this Ben's picture he sent us, he says the file photo from his 2017 CARMS application was unsuccessful despite the puppy. <laughs> Maybe if he had a tiger, a lion beside you, it'd be a, a different chance, but 
Um, so where is he from? He says lots of places. So Ben was born in Squamish, has lived across Canada and in Chicago, and, but now has returned to BC. He did his, a lot of his medical training out in Kingston, Ontario. What do you do for fun? Ben says lately he's been doing mostly disc golf. And he asks that you please don't run over him in the mountain bike, on mountain bikes in the Whistler while he's looking for lost discs. That's, uh, are you married? Ben says yes. He's married to Meredith, who's one of the EM residents in Victoria, I believe there. And do you have any kids? He says kind of. What does that mean? Well, he's got Freddie the cat and baby girl Fred, who's due at the end of November there. So uh, exciting times. The next resident is from Nanaimo and it's Rufenshaw and uh, I know some of the font may be a little small so I'm going to read what she said for those that can't see the back. She was born in Taiwan, calls Vancouver home, did her undergrad at SFU, U of A, uh, med school at UBC and then residency in Toronto. She is interested in having EM physician roles in public health and advocacy global health in relation to climate change and medical education. That's Rufin in Tofino there in July in her rotation. Um, she enjoys a bunch of outdoor activities, ultimate frisbee, catching up with the great outdoors after being in Toronto for the past couple of years, and uh, has have a, a keen interest in politics and adding a fifth language to her list, multilingual. Uh, Christy is also on, uh, Nanai on Vancouver Island in Nanaimo, and she is from Saskatchewan. She did her undergrad in med school at uh, Saskatchewan as well, and uh, her residency and family practice in Strathcona. After her residency, she's been out in practice, so she's actually has some clinical experience working in locums in rural areas in um, Dawson, the Yukon, Iqaluit, Nunavut, other places like that. And uh, interestingly, she lives out of a van. So I, I know I said this as a sort of a joke in the, in the past emails, but she, this is her van. It's, it's kind of pimp, but it's, <laughs> it's still a van. But she's full time there, living with her, her husband, Zeke, and she says it's a lot of fun. She also likes traveling, she does a lot of outdoor activities, and she's uh, willing to try anything once and probably like it, as she puts it. Um, and now Dan Abrams, one of our Vancouver-based EM residents here. He is from Toronto, did his undergrad psychology and philosophy at McGill, med school at the UT, and then family practice up on uh, North Van. His academic interests include medical education, sim, search and rescue, and mountain medicine, as well as global health. And he calls himself a Toronto boy who dreamed of the mountains. <laughs> and uh, I swear to you, these are not Facebook photos from Paul Fee's, uh Facebook page. This is actually Dan doing this. And uh, a nice picture to end it off there. Uh, Anna Maria Gomez. So she <laughs> had a lot of slides. <laughs> but, but so Anna is from Bogota, Colombia. She moved to uh, Canada at the age of 10, moved to North Van did a bachelor's in biology and chemistry. She had a, a swimming scholarship. So Anna's actually quite an elite swimmer. It's not someone who just has competed, but she actually achieved quite a, a high level in the United States there with her competitive swimming. Um, she has parents and a couple of siblings in North Van. One of the siblings is a PT. The other one wants to get into medicine. In her past life, she um, was really focused around swimming. So 10 workouts a week, 24 hours a week. She says her favorite moments were standing on the blocks giving or going last on a relay tied for first watching the, uh, basically everyone watching <laughs> watching you and all the pressure associated with <laughs> that. Yeah, her new life now is, oops, sorry about that. That's not good. Uh -oh. Sorry, my computer is just, this computer sort of crashed in here again.
Sorry, guys. Looks like my computer's dying. Anna had a lot of good things to say about herself, though, and I'll uh, <laughs> maybe I'll uh, reboot my computer and come back. It's just frozen on me, so I can't advance any of the slides. Um, Dan Abrams, so is our EM resident that is going to be presenting today. So may I get him to do his, uh, his talk, and then I'll come back at the end when there's time to uh, finish up with the residents here. Email me the slides and then you I can might. just pull it up on my computer after. Good try. Why don't you go ahead and do your thing though? Yeah. All right. Let's get set up here. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Dan. I'm one of the new uh, CCFP EM residents this year. I have the honor of uh, going first and presenting first at Grand Rounds. Uh, I want to thank uh, Rob, who uh, helped consult and uh, helped uh, me put this presentation together. Uh, so the topic is central lines in the emergency department, taking a look at the literature uh, to try and refine how we think about risk and technique. Now, you may be thinking, who is this guy and what does he know about putting in a central line? A couple months into uh, uh, emergency medicine residency, I'm sure I put in more lines than he has, and you would be right about that, <laughs> most likely. Um, so this is not a procedural tutorial. It's taking a look at the literature and seeing if I can retrieve uh, any pearls uh, that I can share with you to try and bring to practice. Uh, so I'm going to briefly speak a little bit generally about operator-dependent risk and how we think about expertise in central line placement. Uh, I'm going to go through the specific complications of central line placement uh, and a few pearls uh, that I found to share on mitigating risk. Uh, I'm going to describe uh, a novel ultrasound technique for uh, confirming placement, uh, appropriate placement for line use. Uh, if there's time, I'm going to be talking about an ultrasound-guided technique to subclavian placement and a quick preview of a, a new piece of hardware, a new line anchor that's coming to uh, St. Paul's. Uh, so very briefly, um, I'm making some assumptions going into this. This is an audience of emergency room physicians uh, who are very comfortable inserting central lines uh, by a jugular femoral approach. So this is not a procedural tutorial. Uh, I'm also making the assumption that we all agree that uh, the evidence clear that ultrasound guided uh, line insertion, insertion improves uh, safety, and I'm not going to be uh, rehashing that evidence today. So very briefly, uh, reviewing the three uh, standard approaches to central line insertion, the IJ, the subclavian vein, and the femoral vein, quickly going through the indications, which I'm sure you all know, lack of peripheral access, central administration of medications, hemodynamic moderate, monitoring, transvenous pacing, uh, hemodialysis, plasmapheresis, et cetera. There are no absolute contraindications. There we go. No absolute contraindications to line placement, but a few relative contraindications, which I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, local infection or distorted anatomy, uh, and then uh, coagulopathy always listed as a relative contraindication, increasing risk. Uh, but I'm going to revisit that and, and talk, to, talk about that in a bit more detail. Before I get into that, however, uh, I'd like to speak generally about procedural expertise because I can quote to you what the complication rates have been in various studies, but we know that at the end of the day, uh, operator-dependent risk is very important and that our complication risks are 
relative to operator experience and training. Um, one study that uh, quantified this, an older study, uh, found that uh, operators that had performed at least 50 procedures previously had an overall uh, half the complication rate versus novices. And in that same study found that uh, puncturing of the skin, repeated um, attempts uh, were associated significantly with an increased rate of complication with three or more punctures uh, representing a six-fold increase in complications. Uh, this is a newer study that I quite liked. Uh, junior emergency medicine residents uh, who'd completed a procedural training course. Uh, their level of experience was a median of previous 10 lines inserted. And what they did in this study was uh, they used simulation and uh, had them do IJs on mannequins uh, to measure the rate at which they were actually puncturing the posterior vessel wall going through to the back of the IJ. Uh, and they found that in this group of residents who were not experts but had a not insignificant amount of uh, training and experience, uh, there was more than half, 64% uh, needle displacement and uh, puncture of the posterior wall. And yet these residents uh, gave themselves a median 8 out of 10 confidence uh, that they knew what their needle tip was at all times. So this is to demonstrate that this is uh, a difficult skill uh, and one that's, that's prone to error even a, in a group that had um, a non-trivial uh, amount of training and experience. We don't know exactly uh, how to um, uh, how to define what constitutes expertise in line placement, uh, but this group uh, took a stab at it. They used gaze tracking technology to compare the performance of expert versus novice operators and found that experts uh, had significantly more gaze fixation on the ultrasound monitor, whereas novices more frequently scanned down to their hands. So all of this taken together, I think, uh, reinforces the fact that expertise uh, is important in mitigating risk in central line placement. But it had me reflecting on my experience as a resident and asking some questions. Uh, because as I get out into uh, emergency practice and start getting a feel for uh, the realities of practice in 2019, I realized that the indications for central line placement by an emergency physician aren't quite what they used to be 10, 20 years ago between you know, the growing expertise of nursing teams and getting peripheral access, the acceptance of peripheral pressors as safe, uh, the, availabil the availability of the easy I.O. Uh, it seems as though uh, emergency physicians are not performing this procedure, not having to as frequently as we used to be. Uh, so that had me asking questions, which I don't have answers to, but I pose them here as food for thought. Uh, as residents in 2019, will we perform this uh, procedure frequently enough to gain that baseline level of mastery in it? Uh, as staff, will we perform it frequently to, uh, enough to maintain those skills and maintain uh, safety in this procedure? Uh, and if the answer to either of those questions is no, then uh, is there an important role for simulation-based training in building and maintaining those skills? So, some, some things to think about. Um, getting into more specifics uh, into the individual complications and risk mitigation and central line insertion. Uh, so uh, it should be familiar with the complications associated with central lines, which can be divided into the early or mechanical complications, the things that we're going to see in seconds to minutes to hours in the emergency department, uh, mostly as a result of needle displacement, uh, versus the later complications that uh, pop up sort of hours to days to weeks uh, in the ICU uh, and beyond. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have time to go through them all in detail, but I pulled out some pearls from the literature to talk about a few of these specifically. I'm going to touch on bleeding, arterial injury, uh, infection risk, uh, catheter malposition, and uh, pneumohemothorax in the setting of subclavian line placement. Uh, so I said I was going to return to coagulopathy. Um, when, it, when we think about this relative risk uh, posed by coagulopathy, uh, there are some practice guidelines based mostly on ex expert opinion that recommend where feasible um, to pretreat for uh, low platelets below sort of 20 to 50 or an elevated INR. Uh, however, a more recent review in 2017 found that while the rate of minor bleeding complications uh, like prolonged oozing or local hematoma in coagulopathic patients uh, certainly is higher, sort of 15, 20 percent, they found quite rare incidents of major uh, uh, clinically significant or life-threatening complications in these patients. And furthermore, they found that pretreatment uh, was not consistently shown to be effective in reducing those risks. 
Uh, that same group is planning to do an RCT to, to further uh, look into these results. But uh, what I take away from this is that while um, guidelines and the most conservative pro of approach still is to delay line placement in co uh, coagulopathic patients and pretreat with uh, platelets or, or plasma, uh, where there's a clear benefit to earlier line placement, the risks uh, may be acceptably low. Uh, I'm going to speak about arterial injury. Um, uh, it's hard to find good, uh, good evidence on simple arterial puncture, just the needle touching one of the major arteries. Um, but from the uh, expert opinion and reviews that I looked at, uh, simple puncture of one of the arteries uh, is reported to rarely uh, have serious morbidity and is often well treated with direct compression. However, arterial dilation or cannulation, accidental dilation or cannulation of one of the major arteries is a very serious complication uh, with a high rate of morbidity and mortality. Uh, this uh, group out of Montreal reviewed 30 case reports of accidental dilation or um, cannulation of the carotid artery. Uh, they found in 17 of these cases the hardware was pulled and pressure applied and in 13, the hardware was left in place uh, and for surgical management. Uh, and they found with the pull and pressure approach, there was a 47% incidence of major uh, complications, including stroke and death. Uh, and all 13 of these cases were uh, effectively managed surgically, uh, either external or endovascularly. Uh, so the message from the study is, if you find yourself in that terrifying situation of accidentally uh, dilating or cannulating a major artery, uh, to fix that hardware in place and, and call surgery, don't not to pull and, and tamponade it or pre put pressure on it. Uh, line infections, I'm going to try and skip over briefly in the interest of time. Uh, I just wanted to provide the update from uh, the literature that I looked at showing that in more recent years, um, the trend towards femoral lines having a higher infection rate uh, seems to be going away. Uh, where traditionally ephemeral line was considered to be a dirtier line, much more uh, prone to infection. More recent evidence suggests that um, improvements in sterile technique and line care is starting to remove that. So uh, based on what I looked at, I would not consider infection risk to be uh, a reason not to place a uh, ephemeral line. And this is just um, reviewing a study in which they did have avoidance of the femoral site, but just this five-step five uh, protocol, which very dramatically reduced the incidence of line infections, a large multi-center study uh, across ICUs in Michigan. All right. Uh, I'd like to pause a little bit and, and talk in a bit more detail about catheter malposition. So when we talk about catheter malposition, really there are two very different types of problems. There's malposition within the central venous system and outside. So if it's out of the vein, that's a big problem, obviously, uh, of interstitial arterial pleural and mediastinal line. Within the vein, malposition has been uh, considered to be uh, a line that's diverted into the wrong central vein, so something that goes from a subclavian vein and turns up into, into an IJ, et cetera, or crosses over into the other subclavian. Um, and then there's quite a bit of controversy and not a lot of agreement in, in, to, in the literature as to what is ideal line placement um, from the uh, thoracic approaches. So is it too shallow? Is it too deep? Is placement in the RA acceptable? Um, there's not a lot of consistency. Um, but traditionally, perfect placement was um, defined as being around the distal SVC to the entrance of the RA with acceptable placement ranging anywhere from sort of the bottom third, third of the SVC uh, into one centimeter inside the right atrium. Uh, so with that in mind, I'd like to describe a somewhat novel, it's been around for a number of years, but I think not widely in use, uh, bedside ultrasound application for confirming line position, um, which I think is very helpful. So you've got uh, a sick patient, you've had to place the line, um, they badly need uh, ongoing management, and you've called for x-ray, but you're waiting, and you have to make a decision, uh, can I use this line now, or I'm going to wait, uh, wait around for the x-ray. Uh, so this described in 2012, they used a rapid flush, uh, 10 cc's agitated or non-agitated normal saline. In this study, they used agitated normal saline, 
It's also been described with just plain normal saline uh, and using uh, transthoracic views uh, of the heart to actually visualize turbulence and micro bubbles passing uh, into the right atrium and the right ventricle. In this study, they found uh, high sensitivity and specificity for um, uh, correct line placement, and subsequent studies have found similar results uh, with some variation. Here's a picture of what that looks like. Uh, so this uh, is a sub xiphoid view, and you can see this is with agitated sa saline. You're actually visualizing the mic micro bubbles passing into the RV, uh, RA and RV, and this is uh, just another of the same. Uh, the micro bubbles are considered safe in this procedure and not a risk of air embolism. This is actually a diagnostic feature that's been used in uh, inter interventional cardiology for quite some time to detect uh, atrial and ventricular septal defects to see if the bubbles cross over into the left side of the heart. Uh, this one I'm going to skip over. Uh, here's a study that takes things one step further with the bold title of Routine Chest Radiography is Not Necessary After Ultrasound Guided Right IJ Catheterization. Uh, they reviewed over 1,300 uh, records of uh, right IJs that were placed uh, and determined that the rate of malposition being about 1.3% uh, was not significant enough to warrant ordering a chest X-ray. Um, in this case, uh, they defined clinically significant malposition as one in which the treating team had made the decision to pull or reposition the catheter. Uh, however, there were no adverse patient outcomes um, and there were no uh, uh, catheters that were outside of the central venous circulation. So I, I present this, uh, again, food for thought. I don't think I'm going to be, I'm going to stop ordering chest x-rays based on this one paper alone, um, but it does um, help build the case that, you know, in a sick patient um, who needs the use of that line, uh, there is a, a genuine um, uh, benefit to risk calculation that can be made to using that line uh, pre-chest x-ray. All right, with a little bit of time I have left, I wanted to uh, touch quickly on subclavian vein cannulation. I think this has fallen out of favor a little bit uh, because the ultrasound guidance of the right IJ uh, is uh, quite easy and, and quite safe and supported in the literature. But there are some significant ben benefits to subclavian lines, uh, including uh, preferred by nursing for being out of the way and easy to clean, much more comfortable for patients, not sticking out of the neck, not res restricting their mobility, uh, useful in trauma or collared patients. Uh, and some have described this as being a very useful line in hypovolemic patients uh, with the subclavian vein uh, being stented open by its attachment to the underside of the clavicle, whereas other veins might be more collapsed. It uh, is associated with uh, significant risk as well, and of course the one that we worry about the most in this site is pneumothorax, which it does still, uh, of course, have a higher risk than um, an, an IJ. Uh, there are ultrasound-guided approaches to, to the subclavian vein, uh, and one large review showed uh, that with training, uh, the pneumothorax rates could be brought down to 0.3% with an ultrasound-guided approach. Uh, compared to 3.7% uh, with a landmark technique, and ultrasound guidance uh, reduced all complications associated with this line uh, other than catheter malposition. Very briefly reviewing uh, the anatomy and the approach, this slide is just to illustrate this, the uh, typically described um, anatomy of the subclavian veins with the left having a little bit of a shallower uh, approach to the SVC and resulting in a little bit less uh, catheter malposition, whereas the right has a bit of a sharper corner to turn. Um, using ultrasound uh, in the infraclavicular approach, uh, so would be uh, visualizing the vein and catheterizing uh, just a little bit lateral uh, to the clavicle. If we're being technical about the anatomy in this location, it's called the axillary vein. It changes names to the subclavian vein as it passes under the clavicle. Uh, I'm going to skip over that one. So here's a quick video uh, demonstrating ultrasound guidance in the infraclavicular approach, uh, starting a bit laterally at the axillary vein. Uh, you can see in a pre-procedure scan, a 
pleural line is seen, baseline lung sliding is noted. And then the probe is uh, slid medially uh, towards the border of the clavicle. Uh, in this video, they're demonstrating a longitudinal approach to cannulation, which uh, some evidence has suggested uh, may be faster and safer than a cross-sectional approach. However, of course, emphasizing that this is operator-dependent risk, uh, and if you're more comfortable in the short-axis approach, I think that's still a very acceptable approach. You can see in the longitudinal view, uh, the, the entire needle is kept in plane uh, with the tip entering the vessel. Uh, a supraclavicular approach to the subclavian uh, vein is also described. Uh, I'm going to skip over it for the time being, um, but uh, using this uh, even larger, more proximal uh, vessel uh, may be of some benefit in, in very hypovolemic patients. Uh, the last thing I'm going to touch on is just a practical point, a hardware update. You may or may not have seen uh, there are some new line anchors coming to St. Paul's. Uh, so these are the SecuraCath uh, anchors that this is supposed to replace the need to actually suture the line in place at the end of the procedure. Uh, the seven French catheters are for the uh, double and triple lumens. Uh, I think I'm, we are stocking the 12 French catheters. Uh, I, I think someone is looking into whether these can be used to secure a pigtail. I'm not sure if that's completely ready to go, but that's the intention. Uh, for your larger bore, cordis, um, uh, dialysis catheters, those will still be sutured. Uh, very quick demonstration video. Um, so the device has these little wings that you fold down, place your finger on the back, uh, and then it's got uh, the metal tong that goes in line uh, with the catheter. Uh, then you need to hub it all the way to the skin and uh, get the tongs right through the dermal layer into the subcutaneous tissue. The wings slide open. The cover uh, snaps on, and then the whole thing is uh, secured down with a tagoderm without the need for uh, suturing. So uh, the take-home practical points that I think uh, we can take away from some of the points that I shared today, uh, experience matters, and we need to think about how frequently we're performing uh, this procedure to maintain expertise and safety. Uh, in pretreatment uh, for coagulopathy, it's still recommended as standard of care, uh, but I get, again, I, the evidence that I looked at uh, showed a pretty reasonable risk profile to going ahead and placing lines uh, in patients with low platelets or elevated INR uh, if there's a clear benefit to the patient. Uh, if you find yourself with a piece of hardware in one of the major arteries, leave it in place, secure it down, and call a surgeon. Uh, in 2019, it seems that sterile technique matters more than site selection for uh, managing infection risk. Uh, the saline flush test, I think, is a very practical uh, up-and-coming uh, application of bedside ultrasound to confirm line placement, and I think this could become as routine to our post-procedure scan uh, as checking for lung sliding, uh, and that there are still ultrasound-guided approaches to the subclavian vein um, if you choose to go that route. All right. Uh, any questions or comments? You know, as I mentioned, uh, I come to this with not a ton of procedural knowledge myself. The saline flush tests I've read about haven't had a chance to do it yet, so if anyone's actually incorporated that into their practice, I'd, I'd love to hear what they think. Bueller? <laughs>